Her hand has guided my life and my career and, and in incredible and at times startling ways. For instance, back in 1997, I had auditioned for a role that every big name in Hollywood wanted, a role in Terrence Malick's upcoming film, The Thin Red Line. Now, the odds were against me, but I at least I, I got a meeting with Malick. I pulled up at his house in Beverly Hills for my six o'clock meeting, but I couldn't leave the car. I was plagued by self-doubt. I made a decision that if this didn't pan out, if this didn't go through, I was going to have to hang it up. I didn't want to just drift along the rest of my life wondering if I was ever going to work consistently as an actor. It is 6 p.m. I was still in the car. I believe in my heart that the next 10 minutes changed my life forever. In my mind, I was a guy from Mount Vernon, Washington. I wanted to be a basketball player. What the heck was I doing outside of Terrence Malick's house? I'm emotional mess, self-sabotage at full fury. So I started to pray the rosary. It is 6.05 p.m. and I'm still in the middle of the fourth glorious mystery. You see, six months earlier, my manager, who was a bit like a Catholic mystic, said that I should start praying the rosary on a daily basis. My wife, Carrie, taught me how to pray it. So following orders, I borrowed her grandmother's rosary. It was a precious antique heirloom. And I started running them through my fingers and praying without even really knowing the mysteries. I'm already five minutes late for this major meeting with the most sought after director in Hollywood. And I've not finished the decade, so I decide to press on. Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. When I finally finish the Hail Holy Queen, it is 6.10 p.m., I jump out of the car, dash up to the house, but I realize I got rosary beads in my hand. And uh, I knew if I put them in my pocket, I would start fiddling around with them in front of the director. So I turned heels and raced back to the car to dispose of those beads. I opened the car door and made a deliberate move to drop off this rosary. When I get a feeling right here in my heart that I should take this rosary with me. This was not the first time I experienced this sensation. The first time I had this experience, I was 19 years old in a theater in Mount Vernon, Washington. The movie had ended and out there in the darkness, befriended only by my basketball in the, in the adjacent seat, I had a sensation right here in my heart that made me think that I was supposed to be an actor, that this is what God crafted me for, that this is what he wanted of me. You could say it was my personal enunciation, a very deep awareness of my vocation. So reluctantly, I went forward. My rational sense intervened. I knew nothing about acting, no agents, no managers. Hell, I can't even memorize to save my life, as you can see. But I had this conviction. I had a charge. So back on the curb in front of Terrence Malick's house, I decided to take this rosary with me and make my way to the front door. This little maid answers the bell. And on her neck is a miraculous medal. So I say, oh, you're a Catholic. She says, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm Episcopalian. Come on in. So this maid takes me in, and she shows me the house. It's a beautiful Spanish hacienda. And as, I'd, as we're admiring the ceiling while the woman is in mid-sentence, I get the sensation in my chest again, but stronger than I had ever experienced. And without thinking, I reach for the rosary in my pocket, and I interrupt her, and I say, this is for you, ma'am. She's now startled. She said, why did you do that? Tears are now welling up in her eyes. I said, I don't know. 
She says, oh my God. She said, the woman that gave me this miraculous medal, the Virgin Mary, also gave me a rosary that she got from Mother Teresa. But I lost it. And I prayed this morning that God would send me another one. And then you walk in. This woman is now collapsing in tears. I'm shell-shocked. There's a rosary in between us. And in walks the director, Terrence Malick. When he started with, honey, what's wrong? It occurs to me, this ain't the maid. This is Mrs. Terrence Malick, his wife. And I thought, well, better book a return flight back to Mount Vernon, pal. When I got home, I told my wife, honey, I've got some good news and I got some bad news. The good news is I may get the thin red line. The bad news is uh, Granny's rosary is gone. That rosary and I believed that the intercession of Our Lady led to the first major role of my career in the Thin Red Line. We would be nominated for seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Cut to the spring of 2000. I was offered the role of Edmond Dantes in The Count of Monte Cristo. It was a new adaptation of the Dumas classic. This was the first time I had to carry a film on my own. And here I was at the pinnacle of what I long wanted to achieve, but I had no peace. I'm having masses said for this movie and trying to pray, but like you, I was never sure if my prayers were landing. And an amazing thing happened. We are set to shoot a pivotal scene in the film in this grand house in Malta. It is the moment when the Count must decide whether he will remain with the love of his life or leave her to pursue his revenge. And I'm, I look up to the ceiling as I'm weighing this decision. Now in reality, I'm looking up at nothing. I mean, there's nothing up there except white plaster. Then the director, Kevin Reynolds, who is a Baptist from Texas, pulls me aside and says, let me show you what you'll be looking at. I found something down the hall that I think will work for the film. So he takes me into the room about 10 doors away and he points to the ceiling. Well, I'm in shock. I just standing there slack jawed because there on the ceiling is a fresco of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. Now, Kevin Reynolds doesn't know a thing about Mary or the Catholic Church, so I said, do you have any idea what that is? And in a Texas drawl, he says, yup, and leaves the room. Well, I was hesitant to add to that, yup, for fear that he would take the shot out of the movie, so I just kept my mouth shut. But it was a sign for me, a sign that the Lord and his blessed mother were with me. And through all my trials, Mary had been there all along, leading me by the hand guiding me toward her son and my vocation. And if you saw the Count of Monte Cristo, you know that that shot stayed in the film. And I am proud to say that I shared some screen time with the mother of God. Then inexplicably, I get a call from Mel Gibson. Now, my agent didn't call. My manager didn't call. I didn't know Mel Gibson. I wasn't politicking for the role because nobody knew what was happening. Mel Gibson wants me to play Jesus Christ. He wants the guys with the initials of JC, who just happens to be 33 years of age, to play Jesus Christ. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so either. Shortly before this, I was introduced to the apparitions and message of Magigoria by my wife. This would play a major role in deepening my love and service to the mother of all people. It was at Magigoria that I consecrated my life and my acting career to the Blessed Mother, using the traditional consecration form of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. From that moment on, all that I did in my life and in my career was in her service, to do with me as she pleased. I also believe Magigoria prepared my heart to give my fiat to play Jesus in the Passion of the Christ. Filming the Passion of the Christ brought me even closer to Our Lady. The more you experience the Passion of Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, the more you understand the compassion of Mary, the connection between Mary and her son. What mother does not suffer when her child suffers? Playing Jesus 
And the passion also reminds me of the call of St. John Paul II that we all must become co-redeemers with Jesus and with his mother Mary. On the very first day of shooting, the crowd rushed in around me. The guards hit me with whips, which hit my flesh. My arm was wedged under the heavy beam when someone yanked the top of the cross in the other direction. My muscles wrenched and my shoulders separated. I fell to my knees, dropped the cross, and buried my head in the ground. This take now remains in the film. Every day I picked up that thing, it was like a penance. It ripped into my shoulder, turning my flesh an angry red. With each passing hour, it got heavier. Then I had to hang on that cross. It was November in Matera, Italy, bone chilling cold. And I'm up there on a cliff in only latex and loincloth. On a cross, it is not the blood loss that kills you. It is the oxygen loss. You asphyxiate. So I'm gasping for air. My legs were going numb. And guess what? Hypothermia. To bring my core temperature up, they brought in these gas heaters. When they brought them too close, my toes started to fry and the latex began to melt. And that was before I was struck by lightning. And soon to follow, open heart surgery. But I offered up all of this suffering in union with Jesus and Mary for the success of the film that it might lead souls to Christ. And boy, did it ever. The passion reveals the obvious, very obvious biblical truth that Mary, like no other, shared in the suffering of her son as co-redemptrix. As St. Teresa of Calcutta exclaimed, of course Mary is the co-redemptrix. She gave Jesus his body, and the offering of his body is what saved us. The scenes of the Passion profoundly depict Our Lady's role as co-redemptrix with Jesus. In fact, a well-known Italian journalist stated that the Passion of the Christ could also have been justifiably called the story of Mary co-redemptrix. For example, in the film, it is Mary alone who understands when Jesus has been arrested that, quote, it has begun. What has begun? The unified mission of Jesus, the Redeemer, and Mary, the co-redemptrix to redeem the world. When Mary walks the way of the cross with Jesus, she stands opposite Satan. She is his opponent. Mary's role with Jesus to crush the head of Satan is powerfully dramatized. In the Calvary scene, the dying Redeemer gives his own mother to become the spiritual mother of all peoples when he says from the cross, Behold your mother, John 19, 27. In the final scene, Mary becomes a living Pieta, holding the dead body of her divine son. She looks to us all as our loving co-redemptrix who suffered in union with Jesus and calls us all to appreciate the price of our redemption. There are a lot of deep theological truths that Mel Gibson wove into the passion of the Christ. In this chaotic, confused age, ladies and gentlemen, we need truth. And it is true that Mary is the co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, an advocate for all humanity. It is my hope, it is my prayer, that the Pope will proclaim this truth as a Marian dogma, so that every single living human being will know that they have a spiritual mother that loves them, and who will intercede to bring them to Jesus, their true Savior. Now, why is this necessary? if the truth of Mary is already the truth. 
Why does it need a papal proclamation? Well, look at the moment in Scripture when Jesus asked the apostles, who do they say that I am? Ladies and gentlemen, believe me when I say to you, Jesus was not having an identity crisis. He knew who he was, but he wanted the truth proclaimed. When Simon Peter announced the truth, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, then and only then did Jesus found the church and the papacy on the rock of Peter, the first pope. I believe Jesus wants the full truth about his mother Mary, that she is this world's spiritual mother. She is the co-redemptrix. She is the mediatrix to be proclaimed by the present Pope, so that our mother can utilize her full power of intercession to bring peace, true peace, to the world. My friends, <laughs> my friends, in Jesus and Mary, this present world scene is one of unprecedented moral breakdown, natural disasters, and even greater global threats of war and terrorism are now looming in our midst. The killing of the unborn and now born children, sex trafficking children, over 10 million now, the power of Satan is evident no matter where we turn. Our whole world is in desperate need of the peace of Jesus Christ. And his peace, both spiritual and global, will only come to us as it did originally through the person of our mother, our mediatrix, our advocate. At Fatima, Our Lady promised that in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph and a period of peace will be granted to the world. Let us trust in these words of Our Lady. Let us pray, especially for our, before our Eucharistic Jesus, for true and lasting world peace through the intercession of his mother, the mother of all peoples. We will, she will keep her promise, but we must do our part as St. Bernard has written, and as I have seen in my own life, you will not go astray if you follow her. You will not get lost if you call to her. If she is holding you by the hand, you will not fall. If she is protecting you, you have nothing to fear. You will not grow weary if she is at your side. But you must reach out to her. My brothers and sisters, be faithful, call out to your mother, pray the rosary for world peace, adore Jesus Christ in the Eucharist and heaven will respond. Before I leave you, this path will not be an easy one for our bishops, our priests, and our laity who accept this challenge and the fight to fulfill the will of God is never an easy one. But from God's gospel and Mother Teresa's personal creed, they echo this sentiment. Blessed are you when the people hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you, when they reject your very name as evil because of the Son of Man. In the final analysis, it is between you and God It was never between you and them anyway. So yes. Your name may not appear down here in this world's hall of fame. In fact, you may be so unknown that no one knows your name. 
The Oscars and the praise of men may never come your way. But don't forget, God has rewards that he'll hand out someday. This crowd on earth, they will soon forget when you're not at the top. They will cheer like mad until you fall, and then their praise will stop. Not God. He never does forget. And in his hall of fame, by just believing on his son, forever there's your name. I tell you, friend, I wouldn't trade my name, however small. It's written there beyond the stars in that celestial hall. For all the famous names on earth with the glory that they share. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd rather be an unknown here and have my name up there. God bless you.